classic diagrams that I draw in, in almost every class, and, and we'll review it, and it, it'll be up on the board a lot of times. All right? One note, though, I just thought of this, about the times of this class. This class, because it's a four credit hour class, is a little different than the standard class. The lecture actually goes from 10.15 through 11.30. I noticed on my sheet it said it went from 10.15 to 11.15. That's incorrect. I don't know what yours says. It goes actually from 10.15 to 11.30. The lab then is immediately following from 11.30 to 12.20. All right, so just as, uh, as an FYI. All right. Okay. In CISS 216, you created, um, for the most part, what are called static web pages. All right? In this context, what does the word static mean? Not changing. Static means not changing. And if we're talking about web pages, We can maybe add in, just for anyone playing the devil's advocate, not changing unless someone manually changes the page. And the languages that we used for those is, or were, HTML and CSS for the most part. And in the 216 class, we may have introduced a little bit of JavaScript. And so that may have added a little bit of interactivity to it, so it wasn't completely static. But still, for the most part, by and large, these were static pages. In the case of static pages, the web server has a real easy job to do. All right? What do I mean when I say a web server, first of all? What is a web server? Yes? It's where the pages are stored. Okay, it's where the pages are stored. That's true. Anyone want to add to that definition or description? It's where it uh, handles the requests. Like okay, handles the requests. All right. In general, what is a server? server responds to requests. So anytime you have a server and a client, a client makes requests, a server responds to requests. Um, it is, it's entirely context specific, all right? It depends what request you're talking about. You know, sometimes people will say something like, that machine over there is our server. Um, I'm not saying what they're saying is incorrect. I'm saying that they're, they're sort of speaking incomplete. Because a server always relates to a specific transaction, whether something is a server or a client. Because even a server, for one purpose, can be a client for another purpose. We'll talk about that in a few minutes here. All right? A client makes requests, a server responds to requests. All right? Now, in the case of a web server and with websites, what are the clients? machine typing in URLs and making requests for web pages. What constitutes a request for a web page? You know, typing in a URL, uh, clicking a link, 
opening up a bookmark, any of those things, you're going in and you're asking the web server for a page. The web server then is a system, you know, hardware and software, that is listening for requests. And that, that word is used specifically, listening for requests. All right? And when it gets a request, it responds to it. So what makes a machine a server? Well, it has the proper hardware and software. It has the software that's capable to listen for requests. All right, And the hardware is enabled such that it can accept requests and respond to those requests. So that's what makes machine a server. Now in the case of a web server, the software that a machine runs that makes it a web server is called the web server software. All right, And in the case of Microsoft, that's IIS, Internet Information Society. I don't know, something like that. Um, in the case of uh, many other platforms, uh, is the Apache web server. Let me back up for a second. Actually, uh, Apache can also run on, on Windows machines, but oftentimes if you're running Windows, you will run IIS, although that's not 100%. Uh, you, you can also run Apache. Apache is run uh, on other platforms. Hi. What class, is what class are you looking for? Nope. Yeah, what, what room's it in? Okay, try 206 then. It's canceled. Oh, okay. Ah, all right. Um, all right, at any rate, um, so uh, you have your machine that, that uh, is, is with, through permissions, is, is, is able to listen to requests, is capable of receiving requests, and it has the appropriate software to take those requests and respond to it. Now, the request comes in from the client in terms of a URL. The response comes back in terms of a web page, all right, and any other files that are needed for that. Now, in the case of a simple static environment where the web pages are static, the server's job is very easy. Someone should keep track of how many times I draw this diagram or a version of this diagram. We'll put a little counter under the video. Put a counter, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, we have 15 weeks, two sessions, so that's 30. Hi. Which class are you looking for? Okay, uh, that, isn't, that isn't this. I think it's across the hall, and I've heard it was actually canceled. Oh, okay. All right, but, but check across okay, the hall. Okay, thank you. All right. So, in this diagram, the client is someone browsing. And again, the, the definition of a client really has become more complex over time, right? Back, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, let's say, what would that be? 2000, yeah, 2002. Back 10 years ago, the client would be someone sitting at a desktop or a laptop, typically, you know, typing in addresses, clicking on links, and so on. Clients now could include things such as people using mobile devices, people browsing, um, using uh, video game systems, uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, you know, the, the, there's a wider range of clients now. But for the most part in this class, you know, we can, we can think about it in terms of being someone that is, is sitting at a desktop or a laptop. And they're running a web browser. And they make a request for a URL. Universal Resource Locator, I think. That goes through the internet, which is represented by a cloud, all right? The idea is, is we don't know how, or we don't care how, it gets from point A to point B. In 
other words, if I request CNN's homepage, somehow it makes it through the internet and ends up at CNN's web server. All right? And it's not the focus of this class to really care about that, so we won't. That request gets to the web server, which is running some web server software. And it's enabled, it, it, it's able to listen for these requests, and it's able to respond for them. In the case of static web pages, the server has an easy job. The server simply goes out, grabs a web page for, where it, for wherever it lives on the disk, all right, and delivers that web page to the browser. And that file or set of files consists of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, etc. So the files that the browser needs to view that web page get sent back through the internet to that local machine, lives in the local machine in those temporary internet files and all those places, and the browser views those. The server's job is easy. All the server does is, you ask for this file, let me find this file, or files, we'll keep it simple and say as though it's just one file. Finds a file that was requested, sends it back through the internet to the client, who then can display it within their browser. Now all the protocols, TCP, IP, HTTP, and so on, are, are the things in place to make this stuff work, all right, to make all that stuff work, and so that it makes it to the right place, and the machines can handle the request for a web page, and it can handle the response back to the server. So all that stuff is, is what makes it. And really, the, the use of the protocols and the use of the system really is what makes the internet powerful, because then any machine that has a browser that follows those protocols and any server that follows those protocols can talk to each other. Right? They don't have to be the same platform. They don't have to you know, be physically on the same network or, or the same operating system or whatever. All right? And it's done through this manner. The analogy that I give uh, from the fast food world is this is like McDonald's, right? Um, not that you have an upset stomach 15 minutes after visiting a web page. That's not how it's like McDonald's. It's like McDonald's in the sense that you go and order a sandwich from McDonald's. The server, all they do is you order a fish sandwich, they reach in the bin of fish sandwiches and give it to you. All right? You order fries, they reach in the bin of fries and they give it to you. All right? It's not like each sandwich is custom made for you. There's simply a big old bin of stuff. You make a request for something, the server simply grabs it out of the big old bin and gives it to you. All right? And that's roughly what the server does in the case of static web pages. All right? You ask for something, server finds the files you need, simply delivers them to you. All right? Now, let's say we don't want to eat at McDonald's, and instead we want to eat at Subway. All right? Could Subway do the same thing McDonald's does? That is, have a big old bin of sandwiches, and when you came in and ordered something, could they just you know, go in the bin, find it, and give it to you. Why not? Too many combinations. Too many combinations, right? You know, what are the sandwiches, you know, McDonald's menu is relatively simple. All right? Subway's menu, or choice, choices of options, uh, is a lot more complicated in the sense that you can really come up with a lot of different combinations of sandwiches. So, if Subway was going to try to do that, all right, well, you know, 
we have our rule of permutations and combinations. You know, first of all, let's talk about a a uh, a, a tuna sandwich. All right. So a tuna sandwich, could they have a bin for tuna sandwich? No, right off the bat, you have your choice of bread, right? Wheat bread, uh, white bread, and who knows what other kinds of breads. But there's eight kinds. Yeah, I was going to say, there, there's probably eight kinds of bread. So right there, a tuna sandwich isn't a tuna sandwich. A tuna sandwich is eight sandwiches. Actually, 16 sandwiches, right? Because you could get the 6 inch, you could get the 12 inch. All right? So right off the bat, if all we're talking about is if all they sold were tuna sandwiches at Subway, no other toppings, nothing else but the bread and the tuna, there would have to be 16 bins for tuna sandwiches. Well, then it goes from there, right? Because you can get different things on it, right? You can get different vegetables on it and and you can get different dressings, and you can have it grilled or not grilled, and so on and so forth. It's pretty easy if we followed this through, all right? It's pretty easy to see that even for one sandwich, there's a crazy amount of combinations. With lettuce and spinach, all right? With just lettuce, with just spinach, with meat, you know, and so on. Well, you could fix the inches, because if you just made 12 normally, all they do is they cut it anyway, so you just do all 12s and cut them when they wanted a six inch. <laughs> For the Are there any other comments? <laughs> yeah, you could, but then, then, but then what do you do with the six inch? You'd have to go and put it in the six inch bin, move it from the six inch, or the 12 inch to the six inch bin, right? So even there, there'd be more work involved. You'd have to reclassify sandwiches. You know, from bin to bin, which is, is again giving the server more work to do. All right, so I think you can see why we, why my subway can't do that. You know, even with the small examples that we came up with, all right, crazy number of combinations. So what does that have to do in a web environment? Well, think of Google, all right, for example. Google. How many different search terms do people search for in a day? Oh, I don't know. Probably more even than there are combinations of Subway sandwiches. So I type in that I'm searching for HTML5. All right. If Google was going to try to use this model for it, they would have to have a tuna sandwich with six inch toasted uh, with with banana peppers and provolone cheese and so on sitting out there waiting for me. All right. They'd have to have an HTML5 page waiting for me. They'd have to have a CSS3 page waiting for someone else that's searching for that. They'd have to have an ASP.NET page for people searching for that and so on. So you can't really apply the static model to something like Google. And if you think through it, you can't really apply the static model to really any sorts of sites that are relatively small. All right? In other words, you're creating, you run a donut shop, and you want to just put up a website that, that shows what kind of offering you have and gives directions and says your hours. And yeah, OK, you can develop a static site for that. But any really big, large, website, that static model is going to fall apart. So what does a web server do in this case? Well, it gets more complicated, right? And again, think of what a Subway sandwich technician does as opposed to a McDonald's server. All right. In the dynamic model, the request is a little more complicated. I'm not just requesting a URL. I'm not just requesting to do a Google search. I'm requesting doing a Google search about HTML5. 
And if I go to the advanced search page, I can do things like give me only pages that were updated within the past six weeks, make sure they're in English, and so on. So I can add extra parameters. So I can give some parameters in addition to the, to, to the request that I'm making. So I'm not just making a request to this URL, I'm making a request to this URL and I'm giving you these parameters as well. So in addition to the URL, we can provide as part of the request user input. In my mind, that's just like saying, I want a tuna sandwich, but oh yeah, I want it in wheat bread, and I want um, mayonnaise on it, and I want it toasted, and so on down the line. All right? I want to do a Google search, and oh yeah, what I'm searching for is HTML5, and I want pages only in English, and I want pages updated in the past six weeks, and so on and so forth. So, the server then doesn't have a bin of completed web pages to deliver. Just like the person at Subway doesn't have a bin or bins of sandwiches to deliver. What do you have? What does the server have? What does the server have at Subway? At Subway, they got a recipe. They know how to make a tuna sandwich. All right. They have a recipe how to make a tuna sandwich. They have a recipe on how to make a, a club sandwich, a BLT. You know, they have recipes for all these things. The generic term for those sort of recipes in this world are scripts. All right. This is code. Instructions. Notice the difference. This isn't a finished product. This is instructions on how to make a finished product. Just like a recipe is not a sandwich, a recipe is instructions on how to make a sandwich. So, the web server then has a little more work on its hands because the web server has a request that consists of the URL and all of the parameters that the user gave it. And again, in terms of web applications, but when, when we talk about parameters, usually we're talking about like via a form that you type in. All right. If you go to Google Advanced, you're searching for HTML5, you want English only, you want within the last six weeks or whatever. Takes that URL and the parameters, uses the scripts, uses the code or instructions and likely interacts with a database server. To pull information from the database. I don't know what the analogy would be for Subway. Maybe for Subway, the database, you could say, are the bins of the different vegetables and stuff, the ingredients that you're going to put together. So, let's analyze what happens if I do a Google search. If I do a Google search, I, I both request that I want to do a Google search and I supply the parameters of specifically what I'm searching for. That gets routed through the internet to the server. The server has the instructions on how to do a Google search. It has Google's world famous billion dollar algorithm for the best way to figure out what's the sites that match that term or terms that you've entered in. So it has that recipe. It has the parameters. So it has what you're searching for. And it's interacting unlikely, uh, you know, very likely with some sort of database server that where all the different websites in the world are stored somehow. All right? Who knows? I'm sure that's a very proprietary thing 
but obviously it's interacting with some source of data. All right. Now, what happens to all those ingredients? We have, we have several ingredients here. We have our request with the user parameters, we have the instructions, and we have stuff that gets pulled from the database. What happens to all those? Well, the server takes those, puts them together, has the instructions, has the parameters, has the ingredients, puts it together to create, guess what, an HTML file, which again consists of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, to deliver to the client who views the result in the browser. The end result is the same, right? Browsers consume HTML files. People consume sandwiches. When the day is done, whether you go to a McDonald's or you go to a Subway, you come out with a sandwich, right? Why? Because that's what you consume. You don't consume a recipe. You don't consume a database, all right? You consume the end product. In the case of a web scenario, just as with static pages, HTML documents are created. The only difference is this HTML document was created on the fly. It was created specifically for you. All right? And you, you, can, you can see signs of that, too. Because there's actually maybe some other stuff in these parameters that aren't entered in on the form. For example, if I do a Google search for Italian restaurants, all right, if I do that search here, and my brother does the same search in New York City, are we going to see the same results? Nope. I'm going to see Italian restaurants in the Lorraine Illyria area. He's going to see Italian restaurants in the New York City area. Why? Well, because some of the parameters that come in give an idea of the location of the person. Right? Uh, depending on the situation, sometimes that's wrong, all right? but it does typically work and, and it gives you a, an idea of where that's from. All right? If I come back a week, if I do a search now and come back a week later and do a search again, all right, I'm liable to see different responses, right? Why? Because, you know, the internet's being updated constantly. You know, there might be a new website introduced that, that's good, or, or Google's algorithm may have decided that one site is better than another and bumped it up on the search results or whatever. All right? So that page is made fresh on the fly every time it's requested. So as you can see, the server here has a much more difficult job. All right? The server isn't simply responsible for grabbing a web page all right, and delivering it. The server is responsible for actually creating that web page based on all the ingredients that it has. Now, keep in mind that this is the model for um, all server-side technology, all right, and uh, you know all server-side dynamic pages work this way, all right. In other words, this same diagram applies whether I'm talking about ASP.NET, which is a technology we're covering in this class, or PHP, or Java websites, or uh, Perl or Python or any now Ruby, any number of different platforms that this can be done, you know, the scripts can be written in different languages. You know, just like the scripts can be, you know, in English or in French, the recipes rather, in a restaurant. You know, the scripts can be written in a variety of different languages and platforms. And this web server software can be different, and the database technology can be different. But in general terms, dynamic server-side scripting works this way. All right? Only difference between a PHP 
and in ASP.NET is these scripts are done differently. 